Good afternoon. Um, I am Gabriela Stefan, and today we will again talk a little bit um, about um, solar cells. Um, in just uh, the uh, first uh, half of this period, and afterwards um, we will have Miss um, Corny Hatzel, uh, a PhD uh, candidate in physics at UNC Chapel Hill, who will tell you more about um, um, this uh, domain in physics. Okay, so. Um, you recall uh, how we first talk about energy, right? And conservation of energy. So the first thing we would like to talk about today is uh, this little toy, which as you can see, we will touch it like this and it starts moving. But what do you notice? What happens with it? Look, look, will it move forever? Why not? Uh, is energy wasted? What happens? Say it louder. Is, is lost to friction. Okay, so um, do you think we can uh, do something about it um, in order for um, the penguin uh, to be able um, to move um, you, we cannot see it here, uh, but I just need more light um, on it. And maybe I can use the light for this, from this. Okay, and you see. Is the penguin happy to dance for <laughs> forever now? Why? What do you think it happens? I cannot hear. An energy input. An energy input. Where from? From from the light. Uh, but I mean, uh, do you think that there is anything else which makes the penguin to? Uh, dance uh, and not stop at all? I mean, it's only because I brought this light? Yes? Yes? You talk to your partner and tell us. What do you think? What's going on? Where, where the energy comes from? Is it anything else here beside of the light bulb you see in front of you? Is it anything else? Okay, you talked in groups of two and just uh, let us know when you come up with an idea. Yes? What do you think? What do you think? Anna? Um, there is like a photovoltaic cell. I can hear. And when there's like a photovoltaic cell. Right a there. photovoltaic it's, cell? Where? It became darker. Okay. It was light and then it became dark. And maybe there's like electron flow. This, this photovoltaic cell is able to do what? From where? It will convert what kind of energy into what kind of energy? The energy from the light, right? Okay. Into electric current, right? Okay. And inside here, there is a circuit. You see, there is a photo cell which is um, connected to a very small battery. Um, and um, there is another circuit inside of the photo cell. So this is how, um, through electromagnetic induction, um, the 
the penguin is um, able uh, to uh, use the energy, okay? Now, uh, what else do we have here? What do we have here? We have a lot of friction. This is what we have here. <laughs> Okie dokie. So, uh, so let's see uh, how a photo cell, how does it work? What do you know from last meeting uh, with um, Miss Winters? What did she tell you about a photo cell? How is it made up of? Of what? Do you recall? Do you recall the sandwich she showed you? Okay, so that sandwich was made up of what? So, uh, we cannot hear what you're saying. Silicon and phosphorus, which was the negative part, and then boron made up the positive part. Ah, okay. So it was a material which was doped with um, some other element, right? Okay, and. Okay, so let's see why why do we have a current in between? So this is the photo cell which consists of the two layers of semiconducting material which you were telling us about, and it's sandwiched between uh, two conducting metal plates. Do you see the metal plates? Where are they? What color? Gray. Okay. Um, and what do we have um, in blue? What do we have in uh, pink? You can you can look and tell us, okay? So just just tell us what you see because this refreshes your memory from what uh, Miss Winters told you. So one side is the material which is doped with uh, negative carriers and the other side is doped with positive carriers, okay? Okay, so P-type and N-type, okay. So um, how can you explain that an electric field um, is established between the two regions? How can you explain this? You, you talk to your partner and let us know. Okay, who wants to tell us? Yes, who wants to tell us? So, so this is um, the type of the material which, um, which shows you what happens, how the conduction uh, is working in semiconductors, right? And you see the animation showing the formation of, a free, of the free electrons and holes when an electron can escape its bond. Right? So, um, let's see about the band gap. 
Okay, so what are all of these here? What kind of electrons? Okay, and um, if I click start, what do you think it happens? What happens? The electrons are able to jump from where to where? Okay, due to what? How is it possible? to jump from one, uh, one band to another. Okay, it has, it has energy, okay. So then the movement of electrons, um, uh, what do you see here, what do you see here? How do I call this empty space? I call this a hole, right? Okay, the, the movement of electrons into the hole, you just saw it, right? You saw? Okay. So, uh, which one here is the hole, which one here is the electron? Okay. So, the electrons are jumping from what band to what band? From the valence band to the conduction band, okay. You see the movement? Okay. Um, formation of the p-n junction. So you see here that you have the p and n um, types. So n contains what? More electrons and p contains more holes. Right? Okay. What happens now? Is it any uh, are they together or are they separated, the P and N junction? They are separated, okay. And what happens, what is all of this kind of movement? This is the um, thermal movement of the particles inside, right? And they are separated and the uh, carriers are diffused randomly. What happens if we put these two P and N together? What do you think happens? Take away the boundary. The electrons move to the other side. Okay. All of them? No. For how long? Some of them can cross in the different region, right? Um, but... Um, um, if one crosses in the different region, what do we have um, in, in uh, its place? What do we have in a hole, right? Okay. And what do we have in between? What is that the depletion region? Where? What? Say it louder. Where the energy ends up. Is it right? Do, what kind of a field do we have there? Do we, do we have an electric field? This field is helping the holes or it help, it's helping the electrons? To move from one part to, to from one side to another. <coughs> What do you think? Hmm? Okay, so I think I will, um, I will uh, give um, uh, the word now to Courtney to continue the talk.
Council. Um, I am a PhD candidate in physics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, I did my undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Texas in Dallas, also both in physics. Um, I've done a couple different types of research. I started out doing biology research and um, realized I didn't quite working, like working with living things as much as I would have need to to do biology research. Um, and then I started doing some high energy theoretical physics work, um, super colliders and stuff like that. Didn't quite like that very much. Um, and then found my way over to more of a material science physics kind of, it's kind of a bridge with chemistry and physics. I get to set up a bunch of different things and play around in a couple different fields and found a place that I was happy to work with there. I've done some, um, basically in a bunch of different areas. My current research area is dealing with disensitized solar cells, disensitized photoelectrochemical cells. So I'm going to start off with um, talking about what are the sources of renewable energy. Some of these you've probably heard of before in earlier talks. We have sun, wind, rain, tides, geothermal. Um, and the main part of this talk is I'm going to be talking about using the sun because it is huge and it is throwing a lot of energy at us all the time. And so if we can harness just a little bit of that, the sun is there and it's free and that would be great. So the total amount of energy that the sun gives us is 3,850,000 exajoules. So in one year of sunlight, we'd have all the energy from every other single energy resource we've ever used in all time. And so if we just use a fraction of that every year, we should be good to go. All right, so here's, here's some facts on why we're looking into this and not just continuing to burn gasoline. So first off, the global demand for all energy sources is going to grow by 57% just in the next 25 years. Just in the US, we're going to increase 31%. Um, and by 2030, 56% of the world's energy use will all be concentrated in Asia. Electricity demand is going to grow by 40%. And what we're going to have this power generation is going to translate to at least 300 power plants. And so that's a lot of power plants that would need to be built to keep up with our energy demands. Um, currently, about half of our electrical energy comes from fossil fuels, um, so that's like coal, gas, natural gas, stuff like that. Um, and 85% um, of greenhouse emissions are from burning these fuels and using them. So there's, there's two reasons why we want to do this. There's the noble, this is the right thing to do. We should do this. We should try and leave the world a better place, try not to create greenhouse gases and all that. And then there's the financial part of it in which we need to tell the government to get them to fund research in this area and develop this area. So a big, important top of the list um, criteria for this is that we would like to be energy independent. We, wouldn't we don't want to have to say, hey, Middle East, we'd like some oil. We don't want to have to go in wars, whatever, whatever political stance ever. We'd like to be able to say, I live here in North Carolina. I get my energy from North Carolina. And if we can use the sun, the sun shines everywhere. So that's great. So the number one thing that we could do even before talking about solar cells in that um, is called electrifying the fleet. And so what that is is electric cars instead of gasoline-powered cars. So electric, electricity is something that can be generated in the United States. It's energy independent. So it's not necessarily cleaner because we do still have to probably use fossil fuels or however we're going to do it, turbines and different types like that, but we'd at least be energy independent. Or we could drill more. We could try and find oil in Alaska or pipelines and all this stuff. So these are things that we could do. Um, or we could look at it in the more, I guess, noble sort of sense is this is clean and, and good and better for the environment. So how many of you guys know what photosynthesis is? All right, everyone. So this right here is the photosynthesis reaction center in a plant is modeled, and there's proteins and molecules. So 
Essentially what these dye-sensitized solar cells and photoelectrochemicals cells are trying to do is a very similar process to photosynthesis. Would you say, great, plants have been doing that for millions and millions of years. We should be able to do that, snap, no, no problem. They've been evolving for millions and millions of years to get to the point where this is the setup where they're taking, so what is photosynthesis? What are your um, starting products for a photosynthesis reaction? What was that? Carbon dioxide. What else do we need? Sunlight. Sunlight. We need one more thing. Water. And what do we turn those products into? Sugar and oxygen. oxygen. Very good. All right, so this is the actual diagram of all the little different processes that are involved in photosynthesis. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinvent these in a lab setting and that's really complicated. So we don't want to do it the exact same way that the plants are doing. All right, so plants are a little bit ahead of us. Um, so this is essentially a war of technology versus nature. As you can see, this is a solar cell field that has been overgrown by plants. So still, they have the upper hand. <laughs> All right, so what is a solar cell? So a solar cell converts sunlight into electricity. Um, and this is specifically called the photovoltaic effect. The very first solar cell was designed in 1883. So this is not a new idea that we're having. It was only 1% efficient and it was made with selenium and gold, which are not ideal candidates since they are so expensive. So our current technology really isn't that bad, but it is very expensive. So talked a little bit about PN junction and these classic photovoltaic cells. They actually work really well. The only problem is that they're prohibitively expensive, that we can't just put these up everywhere and um, we'd run out of silicon before we could get enough. So what I have here is, so this is from the DOE website. Um, we have the different types of energy technologies. In the purple are your um, multi-junction cells. So these are kind of like top, top notch, thin film, stuff like that. The blue is what, what um, we're normally used to. They, their efficiency is around, max out around 30%. Those are silicon based ones. We don't want to use them because they have silicon in them. And that, takes quite a while. We have some other thin film technologies in the green and disensitized solar cells are currently way down here in the red. So our efficiencies are pretty low, but we're hoping that in this we could maybe slap it up, turn it into a paint, slap it on a wall and do this more cheaply because if it's cheap, it doesn't matter if it's a little less efficient, we could put it everywhere. So as you can see, there's a lot of different groups. You can see different universities and companies all working on completely different approaches. This, this problem about clean energy is being worked on by people in every country essentially right now. So talk about the solar spectrum for a second. So this graph here represents the wavelengths of the light um, that we receive on Earth and how much of it we do receive. The, um, yellow is at the top of the atmosphere and some of that gets lost on the way down and the red is essentially what we see here at sea level. So you'll notice that um, the highest peak of this is in the visible range and that's stuff we see, we know this, we're familiar with this. So we want to try and capture as much of this light as possible and turn that into electricity. If we just, if we're really great at just doing a tiny slice of this, that doesn't help us very much. We need to be good at getting a whole chunk of the solar spectrum, turning that into energy that we can use. All right, so in 1991, this guy Gratzel, he's in, I believe, Switzerland, still around, still doing research. He came up with this idea that um, we can make a solar cell by making um, a sandwich cell. It's a little different than your PN junction stuff you're talking about. Um, and we can use dye that's sensitive to the light and we could build one of these. You could build one of these at home. You could get a little kit to do this. What you have is you have a photoanode and a cathode and you clip them together. You put a little electrolyte in there and shine some light on it and you can get a current out. 
and dyes that you could use that you would have at home would be teas and berries. All plant-based things have some good dyes in them. We can't quite use them in applications for, for real good stuff, and, but you could make these on your own. So in the lab, we use, I specifically use dyes that are based on ruthenium, which is one of the, the metals on your periodic table. Um, there's other, been some good results with polymers, porphyrins, different types of organic and non-organic molecules. There's as many ideas as you could ever come up with. People are looking in different routes to try and solve this problem. So this is what our Gratzel cell is. So on top here, we have a transparent electrode. So what that typically is, is it's glass that's coated with um, the one that I use is fluorine dope tin oxide to make it a little conductive. Um, and on top of that, these gray spheres represent um, TiO2. Titanium dioxide is the most prolific um, semiconductor that is used in these technologies. Uh, it does a great job separating charge, which I'll talk about in a second, and it is very cheap. Titanium dioxide is in your sunscreens, it's in wall paint, it is everywhere, so it's something that we can easily make and have a lot of. These red dots here are photosensitive dyes. So TiO2 has a band gap of approximately 3.2, depending upon what morphology you're using. And so what that corresponds to, if you were using just TiO2, that's in the UV spectrum of light. And so that means that in order to promote our electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, we can only take UV light. UV light is only about um, 3 or 4 percent of the entire spectrum. Remember how I said we want to use as much as possible? So TiO2 by itself, it can work just fine. We can use it to split water um, and all that, but we can only get it with UV light and that's only a tiny part of the spectrum. So what we do is we put a dye on top of there that receives, so, so right here is, here's our dye that is on top, and what happens is sunlight comes in and it promotes our electron to an excited state in the dye. And um, my favorite thing to say about science is nature is lazy. It wants to be in the lowest energy state possible all the time. So what happens is you give this electron energy and it's in the excited state, it doesn't want to stay there. So what it does is what we're tr trying to make it do is instead of going back down to the ground state of our dye and ejecting energy that way, that doesn't help us all. We have this energy level matched up right a little bit below it is the energy level of the TiO2. So we want our electron to go from the excited state of the dye into the TiO2 through the transparent electrode, which is electrically connected to a counter electrode. And from this, we can either get current or solar fuels. We'll talk about that more in a second. So what it looks like, if we can get it to go. So here's our electron going through our circuit. And what happens is in this electrolyte in the center, it is an iodide triiodide couple, which helps to then neutralize the dye and turn over the reaction so you can continue to use this. All right, so I'm going to talk about two different things. So there's dye sensitized solar cells, and that's essentially the picture that I just showed you. And those take sunlight and they turn them into electricity current like that. The other type that we deal with are Disensitized photoelectrochemical cells. These are used to take light and we turn it into some sort of chemical reaction. So I'm specifically looking at splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. Both hydrogen and oxygen are very effective fuels. Um, other people are using it to reduce carbon dioxide into more usable compounds. So you're not only taking carbon dioxide out of the air, but you're turning it into something that you can use. So the process of splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen is, is called electricity. Electrolysis. Um, so that's when you actually transform a chemical species. So right here, the cathode is on the left, and that's where we create hydrogen. And the anode is on the right, and that's where we create oxygen. So in a cell like I just showed you, the anode over here would be where the TiO2 and the dye, and you'd have a catalyst on there to create the oxygen. The um, cathode uh, would be a platinum Cathode seems to be the best now. There's other people looking into platinum, also not very cost effective. There's other ways you can look at that and do with that, but this is the, the other electrode, the counter electrode, and that's where we get our hydrogen out. 
So in 1972, the first paper came out um, by these guys, Honda and Fujima, uh, that showed that you could take TiO2, put it in water, shine light on it, and split water. So since then, we've been working on that. So I'm going to show you a picture of a cell. So this is a little, a little video of what an actual um, solar, um, solar fuels looks like. So right here, what we have is, this is a cuvette, and in it is water. It's also probably some sacrificial agents to help speed up the process, which ideally we would want to use, but they do make a better video. And this slide in here is the electrode that has probably TiO2 and whatever dye on it. And we're going to see, it's about a minute long, they irradiate the this. This solar cell device mimics the ability of a leaf to convert sunlight into usable energy. It's the brainchild of a team led by MIT's Daniel Gino Serra, working in conjunction with so researchers at Sun bubbles. Catalytics, a company the that Nocera founded. That's hydrogen gas. That's the device is the based water. on two water-splitting photocatalysts developed by Nocera's group. Simply dropping the solar cell in water and exposing it to light, oxygen bubbles begin streaming off the side coated with a cobalt borate catalyst, and hydrogen bubbles begin streaming off the other side coated by a nickel molybdenum zinc alloy catalyst. If placed in a vessel with a barrier, the hydrogen and oxygen could be collected separately and stored, and then later used to power a fuel cell. Nocera envisions right, this type so of simple, low-cost so solar cell, actual, once optimized, could be useful to, to power individual homes in developing regions that, uh, around the I use in the lab and I use in my research. This thing on the right here is a solar simulator. It mimics the solar spectrum, and you could tune it to see how intense it is. Um, used to be if you wanted to test one of these, you'd have to wait for a real sunny day and go outside. Um, now you can buy one of these, they are not cheap, um, solar simulators and they mimic the, remember that radiation spectrum of all the different wavelengths? They mimic that pretty closely. Also, there's a little knob that you can make it brighter or less bright, which is not something that we have with the sun. All right. So, So it's talking about the difference between, so DSSCs are dye-sensitized solar cells. They look similar to silicon cells um, that you, we already have out there, and what they do is they take sunlight and convert it to electricity. Dye-sensitized photoelectrochemical cells are actually used to make hydrogen and oxygen chemical reaction. So this right here is a energy schematic of what I'm working with. So right here, this is a TiO2. On the bottom is the valence band, the top is the conduction band, and attached to that is a catalyst chromophore assembly. So what that is, is this first C here, this is the chromophore. This is sensitive to the light, it captures the photons. So this is the thing that's taking it from the ground state to the excited state. In addition, we have a catalyst, and the catalyst takes some of these electrons and converts water into oxygen. So we have two different molecules. They're both, they both have ruthenium centers on what we're doing, and they're attached together. In order to get oxygen out of this, and um, so the catalyst creates, um, transfers holds over here to make the oxygen, and electrons over here, the electrons complete the circuit, and they produce hydrogen over on the other end. In order for this to happen, we need at least one, four photons for one reaction. So the chromophore keeps capturing these electrons and uh, photons and transferring electrons um, from the excited state. In between here is we have a semi-permeable membrane. So what this does is it allows your ions, H plus, to transfer through, but not back, because you don't want things to turn back into water on you. So the whole part of this, the whole game that we're playing with this is we're trying to separate charges and separate species and have them recombine later when we want them to. So let's keep moving forward. So, a little more detailed schematic on this shows that, um, so the hole transfers over here, this is the catalyst, to create oxygen from water, and then the electrons get transferred into the conduction band, and they go ahead and make hydrogen. All right, so here comes 
part of my specific research that I'm doing now. So as I mentioned, TiO2 is uh, number one semiconductor in this area. And specifically anatase. So what anatase is, is it's a specific crystal structure of TiO2. And it's the one that I was telling you has the 3.2 um, electron volt <laughs> band gap that's in the UV. Um, TiO2 is really great because when you inject charges in it, it's good at keeping the charge separated and not having them travel back to the dye. You don't want that to happen. So what I'm trying to do is um, trying to come up with a new type of TiO2 that we can use that will improve this process. So what, what I start with is we buy anatase nanoparticles. So they're little spheres. They're about 30 to 100 nanometers. Um, so these are just commercially available. We buy them. Um, and we cook them in a stainless steel autoclave in 10 molar sodium hydroxide. And what happens is we have such a high concentration of ions, 10 molar is, is pretty intense. And the sodium ions go between the layers of the TiO2 and kind of pull them apart a little bit. And then what happens when you wash them, they roll up. And so we get these neat tubes that are multi-layered. Um, so it's kind of, they're concentric circles, they're usually about three or four layers depending on that. And um, show you another picture, maybe. So here's an SEM. So this is a scanning electron microscope image of the resulting process, a result from this cooking process. So these are huge aggregates, while well, huge, large and small become a very relative term. Um, by huge, this scale bar down here, this is two microns. So that's two times 10 to the negative six meters. So this is huge for me. Um, and they get all tangled up kind of like spaghetti. If we want to look at TEM, we can get a higher resolution picture. This is transmission electron microscope. And you can actually see the different layers of a single nanotube here. And you'll notice that this is 20 nanometers, so our scale, we've definitely zoomed in a lot since the last picture. All right. so. These nanotubes are great. However, since they form those big spaghetti type bundles, they clump up and they have a real hard time being made into films. And inevitably, we want to put them in a film so we can incorporate them in a disensitized solar cell. So what we do is we take our nanotubes and we um, put them in a milling process. And we put them in is essentially a glorified blender. Not all science involves very expensive machinery. Um, and we put them in there with zirconia beads. And these zirconia beads spin around. So unlike your blender at home when you're making a smoothie or milkshake or whatever that has a blade in there and the blade does the chopping, in this process here, we have a little fin that spins it around. And what actually does the cutting is these zirconia beads. They run into the nanotubes. And that collision actually cuts the tubes. And whether we allow this to be done in a hot environment, like 90 degrees C, or in a cold environment, an ice bath, determines whether we get nano sheets, which is this top picture here. They're kind of fluffy, or nanotubes. And so what this is, is these are the same tubes we saw before. They're just shortened. And the sheets are the same tubes. They're just unrolled. So now we have this nice suspension over here of the anatase particles that we're working with, either the sheets or the tubes, depending upon what we want to deal with. And we can, since we have this nice suspension, we can put them in films, and we can work with them now. So here on the bottom is an SEM image of the film. They make these nice, large, uniform films. Um, we do want them to have a high surface area. So you notice it's very porous, and you have a lot of crevices and stuff. Because the more surface area you have, the more room you have available to create that oxygen and to, capture, to put dye on there to capture light. And so the reason we're using these nanostructures is because they have a greater surface area, and that gives us more area to work with. On the right here is, um, I don't know how well you guys can see it, this is a film. On the right half, we have TiO2 on there. And so it's transparent, which is important because the light shines from the back side. So it needs to make it through to the dye. And so we're good with that. So next thing we do is we sensitize this with a dye. So this is one of the ruthenium-based dyes that I was talking about. And you can see here, so up here, this is a UV vis diagram. And the green curve here is just the nanotubes. 
So you'll see that there's no peaks on here. The reason this increases is you're getting around the band gap and you also have scattering. So that's not a, a physical representation of what we're looking for. When we load the die, you see this peak arise. So this is right around, from this region, the dye is photosensitive. So you can see without the dye, we don't have any photosensitivity in that region. And with the dye, we do. So you can see it's, it's kind of orange. And um, from that, we're now going to make a dye-sensitized solar cell. So the dye-sensitized solar cells are kind of the first step before you make dye-sensitized photoelectrochemical cells. It's kind of like the starter. If you can make a current with it, that's good. Then we can see if we can make fuels with it. So if I want to build a DSSC, this here is the conducting electrode. So it's the glass with the fluorine dope tin oxide on top. And I deposit some TiO2 and synthesize it. I put an electrolyte in there and I seal it all together. Right here is a platinum counter electrode. So what it is, it's a piece of glass that I've sputtered on a couple nanometers of platinum, so not that much platinum. And then I make electrical contact here and here, and I measure the type of current and photoconversion. So photoconversion is how effectively am I taking light and turning it into electricity? Because we want that number to be high in order for this to be a viable technology. Well, as it turns out, it is not high. It is actually very sad, about 4%. So what this is saying is only about 4% of the photons that we're absorbing are being transferred into electrons. Not very great. Um, so why did we choose these nanotubes? We thought maybe they wouldn't be great because it's hard sometimes to get all the little nanoparticles <laughs> to stick together and we need them to be in good contact so we can have electrical conductivity. So we chose anatase as our material and standard anatase, which is what everyone is using now in nanofilms, has two main crystal surfaces. We have the 001, which is only about 6%, and the 101, which is the other 94%. So our tubes are 100% this 001 surface. So we're all this minority surface. So as I said before, nature is lazy. When these crystals grow, they grow in the surface that has the least amount of energy. So the least amount of energy is this 101 surface, and it's the least reactive. So the 001 surface of titania, as you can see, we have formation energies here, is a much higher energy. The reason that is, is not all the, t the titania on the surface are coordinated with oxygens. So they have a need to have more things coordinate with them because they're undercoordinated. On the standard 101 surface, all of our titania are... Um, we can have some that are five-fold coordinated. Some of them are completely coordinated, so it's a lower surface energy. So most of these nanoparticles that people are dealing with have a fully coordinated surface. So what we want to do is we want to exploit the fact that this surface is really reactive to see if we can get it to hold on to the dye longer. Because if we want to split water with this, we need to be able to have a dye stick on a surface under illumination and in water. And this sounds like a basic thing, but these are two of the most difficult things ever. To have something stay attached to a surface in water is actually one of the biggest problems that people face in chemistry. And so what we did is we looked at, so on the top here is nanotubes, nanosheets, and nanoparticles. And this top little bump here represents the dye. Um, the other bit of the curb represents the TiO2, and we don't really care about that. But as you can see, after soaking this in water, we only lose a little bit of the dye on the nanotubes and almost none on the nanosheets. However, we end up losing about 70% of the dye on what people are currently using. That is really bad for water splitting. In addition, we tested these to see, hey, do they, what if we illuminate this on our surface? So we have these, um, this is actually an acidic condition because they, they work best in acidic. And so for the nanotubes and the nanoparticles, they, this is over 16 hours of being illuminated with 10 sun. So the intensity of light is 10 times the sun. And so what happens is we lose a little bit, but we lose a lot more in the nanoparticles. So the fact that the surface we're using is more reactive means that we can hold on to that dye and actually use this for water splitting instead of just using it for a dye sensitized solar cell. So what's next is to try and employ that surface in a different crystal type shape so that we can have 
great die stability, and great electrical connectivity. If you guys have any questions, um, that's pretty much all I have right now. Um, feel free to ask anything. Yes? I can't quite hear you. I'm just asking for clarification. Okay. For the TiO2 and uh -huh. the die, does the die actually interact with TiO2 or the TiO2 a filter? The TiO2, um, the die actually bonds to it. Um, it has phosphonate linker groups that are actually bonded to the surface of TiO2. So what happens is the dye captures a photon. That photon, what it does is it takes the energy from the photon, promotes an electron, and then the electron injects from the dye to the TiO2. So we use the TiO2 as a charge separator because if we just had the dye there, there'd be no reason for the electron to transfer to the electrode. It'd just go back and neutralize itself. So we have the TiO2 there to suck up this electron so that we can get it away from the now um, positively charged dye. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So, so what ideally you'd want to be able to do is um, if you could incorporate this maybe in a paint that you could paint on people's roofs. And the technology is far back from this. This is one of those. We'd love to be able to do this. Because what happens is in order to use the sun, you're going to need to cover large surface areas with whatever solar capturing device wins. So there's a lot of different technologies. Um, it's not clear at this point which one's going to be the one that's going to help us out and save us all, essentially. So we'd like to be able to incorporate this into something that we could put everywhere. There have been some groups, um, I believe over in China, that have made flexible, um, they've essentially made a similar design as to this, but instead of being on glass, they'll put it on thin plastic or polymers. And so they could actually wrap it on windows, wherever you wanted to put it. Um, so it's. It's a little theoretical now, but there are the technologies there. I think the, as you saw in one of the first graphs, our efficiencies for these dye-sensitized solar cells now are around 11%, which is still less than the silicon ones. I think the ones that you go out to the store and if you wanted to buy and put them on your roof are between 30 and 40%, but they are theoretically a lot more expensive. So what we're trying to do is take a cheaper technology and make it as good as it can, and then everyone will want it. Other questions? All right.